Chris, how you doing, buddy? Doing very well, thank you. Uh, so uh, last week I was talking to Jay Christopherson, and I was discussing. I think it was something to do with barrel chambering or some kind of tooling, and he says, "Yeah, my friend Chris made one similar to that," and uh, he sends me a picture from your website. Okay. And I go, "Wait, you're friends with the OBT guy?" <laughs> And he goes, yeah, he's the one that got me to F class. I'm like, how did I not know this? I need to talk to him because I've read your website at least once in its entirety. So, oh boy, so glad, so glad I get to talk to you. Yeah, good to talk to you. I've been following some of the things that you've been doing, and of course, Jay's told me about uh, his connection with you. So, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I love that that uh, we run in such uh, small groups sometimes, you know, s- circles. Um, so you and I, long time ago, we we uh, exchanged emails. Of course, that's back when I was, man. I'm gonna say ten years ago, when yeah. I was I was all about the OBT. I was all. I mean, that's that, that was that was my way to developing loads. And uh, before I, I'm going to have you explain the whole OBT thing, but let me tell you my my story about that. Um, I found it, and I'm always looking for the next best thing, right? And when I found your OBT, the optimum barrel timing uh, theory, I like I said, I read your website probably more than once. Everything you were writing, and uh, I asked you some some questions through email, but one day, I'm going to a match, and I get this 284 Shihane. It was the first time I'm taking this 284 Shihane to a match. And I don't know what to load, but I also don't want to miss that match. And it's a three-and-a-half-hour drive. So I said, yeah. what do I load? I don't have a load worked up for it. I said, well, let's try OBT. So I got into QuickBooks. Uh, I use retumbo powder which is not used for there was nothing out there to talk about retumbo but based on the obt retumbo would work and it worked really good <laughs> so i loaded retumbo and i went to the obt and then i went half a grain i think or maybe 0.3 grains on each side of the obt and i went to bayou rifle club and the next day uh, with obt i set a range record Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It it worked wow. surprise. I mean, it was dead on. Like I set a range record. It it was it was amazing. And uh so anyway, that's my OBT story and uh so I followed it for a very long time. But uh, you know, let's talk about let's talk about you for one and then eventually hopefully we'll get around to why I got away from OBT, but a lot of it has to do with a lot of it has to do with uh <laughs> with a uh, quick load i needed to upgrade it and then it, you know it's not very easy but anyway uh I- i'm excited i don't know if you can tell i'm excited to talk to you <laughs> okay <laughs> so tell tell us who you are and where this whole obt thing came from well um so i'm an electronics engineer i've been basically radio frequency engineering for my whole career since the 1980 out of grad school and um, mostly uh, mostly space payload satellite stuff. Um, and I got into, well, I was a pistol shooter all through this time, just, you know, uh, PPC and, t- you know, pistol target stuff, even a little silhouette stuff. But... <coughs> Excuse me. I got my first um, centerfire rifle uh, around the 2002 time frame, and because I wanted to go out and try prairie dog shooting, so I went and took a trip to South Dakota. It was a 223, and I had a 220 Swift as well, all factory. And I went out and I shot. It was a lot of fun, but I said, you know, I wonder if it could shoot better. And so that got me into because I'd been pistol reloading. So I started doing reloading center fire and then, and you know, the drill, right? What do you start? You start looking at the books and then, okay, you could try the suggested loads in the books and you work around and the accuracies, you know, can be all over the map, depending on where you're. So how do you find that? Right. And about the same time I started 
correspondence with a guy named uh, Dan Newberry. The, um, he, he was the guy that came up with a round robin uh, approach for, uh, you know, not like a ladder, but basically a, a clustering algorithm for how to how to pick the best load. The uh, OCW, right? The OCW. optimal charge weight. Right. And so talking with Dan and, and I was deep into some big projects at work and I was I needed something to to get my head out of this. So I started thinking about what's actually going on. Why, why, when you go from one charge weight to a range of charge weights, you know, your groups get bigger, the center of point of impact moves around, and then the groups can tighten up. And then, you know, as you sweep through your charge, why why is that happening? And I read a lot of theories about, you know, the barrel whip and, and I, I had done a lot of finite element modeling when I was um, in my, in my uh, early thirties, cause I was competitive bicycle riding for a while. And I started building my own bicycles, which was a side gig that I had. And I got into trying to come up with better uh, uh, tubing cross sections for bicycles for better stiffness. So I, I ended up doing a lot of uh, finite element modeling for that. So I kind of knew enough of the mechanical engineering discipline to start thinking about what was going on. And I said, you know, the bending modes of the barrel are very, very slow compared to the speed that that bullet leaves. I mean, that bullet's out of there in, in under two milliseconds, depending on the load, you know, one to two milliseconds, uh, thousands of a second. And, and that's like a thousand Hertz. And I'm saying, you know, there, whatever bending modes are there, it it can't be that. There's got to be something that's a lot faster than the than the bending, the vibrating string analogy. And that's when I started thinking about, um, you know, what other things are going on in the barrel. And that's when I started think, got the idea that maybe when that pressure rises, and it's pretty quick, it goes from nothing to pretty darn near full pressure in about 200 microseconds depending on the load and the powder, of course. And that that expansion of the chamber is gonna put a big shock into the barrel. And my initial thought was, I hadn't thought through the physics real clear. And I said, "Where that shock's gotta go somewhere. And in my website, you know, there was an anecdote there about uh, an antenna tower. This is in central Maine where I'm from originally. And um, big tall tower like 2500 feet tall it had these big guy wires and my buddy and I were out there kind of looking it around and, and I remember popping the guy wire with my hand like this and see the wave go off into the clouds and then a couple seconds later it came back and it hit the it hit the guy wire the dead man and went reflected so I'm sitting watching this wave bouncing back and forth and I go I thought that was interesting. So years later, when I'm doing this barrel work, I'm thinking, oh, I wonder if that's what's going on in here. So I started building some models in MATLAB, of uh, just simple models of a acoustic wave, which is going at the speed of sound in the steel. And knowing that if that wave is distorting the barrel in any way, when it hits the end of the barrel, there's, there's nothing there. It can't keep going, so it has to reflect. And this, this is a very common thing in radio frequency stuff, reflecting waves off the end of transmission lines. And so I started working on that and came up with some an idea that there's traveling waves of distortion in the bore, okay, bore diameter, that were related to the length of the barrel and the speed of sound in the barrel. So I started working on that and I went and used quick load because that's what I had. And quick load gives you the barrel time from the 10% of the max pressure to exit. It's a number, it's as good as whatever quick load gives you. And as you know, quick load is, it's only as good as the, as the data that you've got in it, including the powder and the, the bullet, but it's something, it was something I had that otherwise I had no other way of estimating that time. And I started doing some work at the local range here with my 223 Ackley, which was a, a, on a Savage. And I don't know, I probably spent four months going like every other day and shooting a whole bunch of loads. And I had a pressure trace instrument on, the, on that so that I could measure the pressure versus time. I had my chronograph, my uh, 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 Euler 43, 
uh, chronograph, took tons of data over all sorts of different charge ranges and started seeing this correlation between velocity for that particular bullet load combination and group size. And then it started, surprisingly, it started to correlate with what the shockwave model was saying. And the subtlety here is, is that my initial thought was this was a, a like a barrel bulge, okay? Which is intuitively you think of a, you know, like the pig and the snake or, or a hose expanding. And it wasn't until after, long after, probably a couple of years after I wrote the paper that I realized that's really not the accurate physics. And a lot of people have, have written to me and, and asked me about the model. I said, well, you know, the model was just a start. Um, but I've since come to understand that what's really happening is, is that when the chamber expands, it gets shorter. Something called Poisson's ratio. If you put a piece of material under stress, like a, think of a rubber eraser on the bench, on the table. If you press your thumb on it, it'll, it'll compress it, but it gets wider in the other dimension. That ratio is Poisson's ratio. It's, it's, it's uh, a function of the material. And in steel, it's about one third. So if I, if I take a cylinder of steel and I push it down, it'll get fatter by about one third of the amount that I push it down. Well, it goes the other way. If I stretch a thing of steel, okay, it will get skinnier. And so if you think about what happens is if I expand my chamber and it gets big, it shrinks end to end. Well, it's, it's tied to the stock on the receive side. So that shrinkage basically is pulling the back of the barrel back. It's like, it's like a reverse hammer blow that happens in 100, 150 microseconds that pressure pulse comes up. So that chamber expands two or three thousandths of an inch. That is your acoustic wave because the, the pressure, it, it's not a bulge, it's actually a stretch. And when you stretch it, the bore actually narrows up a little bit. So my model was for an expansion wave, but in reality, it's actually a contraction wave. But once that takes off, it does go at the speed of sound. And I'm, and I'm very confident that, that that's the phenomenon here. It's not a stress wave that's moving along the barrel. It's actually a stretch. And, and it, when it hits the end, it can't go anywhere. So it comes back and then it hits the receiver and the, the threads on the receiver, the receiver might as well not even be there from the stress wave. Nothing, no energy gets coupled back in. And by the way, it doesn't get coupled into a breaker, a suppressor either. And I've verified that just recently, I got uh, my first suppressor on one of my rifles and, and showed that it, it didn't change anything hardly at all. I mean, Bending mode, yeah, but not shocked. So go 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 through forward in time. I refined my um, my model a little bit, worked it up. I worked up empirically based on the 223 Ackley and then my six dasher, which I started shooting. Uh, and that correlated well. So I worked up some an empirical model of the relationship between the best time to leave the barrel, okay, after that pressure rise started and based on barrel length. And so in my paper, there was a table of data that I took um, from some of my MATLAB models. And then I built some equations and I built a little tool for it. And I think there's a fellow in South Africa that came up with an even better version of that Excel tool, which is out there. And I can't remember the name of the fellow that did that, but um, so basically, the whole idea is, is that wave is that shock wave is going back and forth. It's it's changing the bore diameter. And the idea is you want to leave the muzzle when that bore diameter is as stable as possible. Bigger, smaller, I don't think it really matters in my opinion. It's really just not changing because if the bore diameter is changing, then very slight variations in the exit time of the bullet, which is basically load variations, will mean that the, the bore is at a different diameter and the the disruption of the bullet is when that gas goes by. Just as the bullet uncorks, it's still, depending on the load, 10,000 pounds per square inch of gas pressure behind it at that point. And that gas is moving supersonic, moving faster than the bullet at that point. So, In fact, the bullet still accelerates for about 20 bullet diameters past the end of the muzzle. I don't know if you're aware of that, but that pressure is enough to push the bullet even faster. So... 
that jet by the bullet, if if there's any variation in the muzzle diameter, it'll change the dynamics of that jet, which can potentially cause the bullet to tip a little bit. And of course, if the bullet nose tips, that's where it's going to go, right? So the whole idea was is if if the if the muzzle is stable during that time, then you have the most um, uh, compliance to variations in exit time because of your load. And so the idea is you want to find a load that gives you good groups and over a fairly wide range of load because you don't want to be like riding on the razor blade and having, you know, three tenths of a grain or a 10 degree temperature change suddenly make your load blow up. And and because I, I think everybody's found one of those loads. I know I found plenty of them. That was the whole idea. Absolutely. Um, so you asked me if I know about the gases. So I make muscle brakes, you know, mm -hmm. with, that have a tuner attached. But uh, my muscle brake has a an expansion chamber. See, most muscle brakes out there, the, the ports have a hole which is slightly larger than the bullet diameter. Mm -hmm. Mine is actually bigger than that. And the reason for that is to allow the gases. I'm trying to strip those gases away from the bullet. Right. That's why my muzzle brake is done that way. And people ask me that, and I've never told them why. I just tell them, well, it's, a, it's an antechamber. It's an expansion chamber. Uh, number one, it makes the brake more efficient. But number two, this <coughs> brake of mine is purposely designed for precision and accuracy. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to get rid of those gases so that when the bullet leaves, uh, it's as free of gases as possible, you know. Yep. So anyway, that so yeah, I'm aware of that. Um, obviously, not to the extent that you are. <laughs> Let's clarify that. Uh, but very interesting uh, about the the concept that the that the actual diameter is shrinking, you know, as as it stretches. Uh, so based on that, you know, we've all seen it. I mean, I. You know, I'm a competitive shooter, as you know. And one of the things that I test for is load stability in a sense of I want them to impact two or three loads in a row, you know, like six tenths or even eight tenths of a grain, that there's no there's no shift in on impact vertical. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? I want them, yep. even though I'm increasing the charge, I don't want that group to shift. I want them to stay relatively the same on target right and that gives me that stability that you're talking about but what causes i mean the barrel is obviously moving right that's that's what causes because you know as you increase charge it moves around on target mm -hmm. most people have never seen this but you know i do a lot of thousand yard shooting and not only people think that they always go up you know, as you increase charge, they don't always go up. They move around. And, you know, that's where the, you know, the tuners come in. But, you know, that's probably going to have to be another discussion. <laughs> but what what have you found to be the most consistent? Because everybody's looking for low extreme spread, low standard deviation. Does that correlate with with the optimum time to leave the barrel? Yes. And one of the things that I get a lot of comments on about the OBT is that it completely ignores the bending modes. And I and I say, absolutely right, because if you read my paper, it originally said, OK, I'm not looking at the bending modes, which are obviously happening, you know, which is why your group moves around. It's the it's the sinuous bending or whatever that pattern is very complex, I'm sure. Um, and there's other guys that have modeled that like barman al's got some stuff on his website there's a bunch of people that have published some data on the bending um i only looked at the shockwave effects but the reality is you just mentioned both of those have to be in tune for the rifle to shoot right i i've never said otherwise and anybody that's ever corresponded with me I'll, I'll tell them that you have to have both in tune so that's where your tuner comes in or just the right length of barrel for that particular barrel cross section, whatever whatever barrel um, profile that you're using, you want to have the right length, and you need to have the exit time tuned for that shock weight. When those two are together, you're going to get your best group over the widest range, and you're also going to get 
the the least variation of the point of aim, which is due to the bending modes. And that's where your tuner can come in to bring that in. That will bring the bending mode tune in line with where you have a group size tuning, which is the OBT. So those two together. For me, I never played with tuners because I found that a 31 and a half inch, one and a quarter inch diameter barrel, which will fit on my F-class gun and make weight, that for the dasher was absolutely the perfect length for it. But I, I tried cutting them back. You know, I tried longer, 33, and that 31 and a half was right on. And that was where I was getting my best, as you said, overall tune, which is the group size. Because um, I understand exactly what you mean. You want to be able to go out there and as your as environment changes, as your barrel temperature changes, you want that group not to drift around on the target. You don't want to be chasing, you don't want to be chasing your barrel warming up and having to be chasing your zero, which is effectively what would happen. So uh, uh, when we started, I told you that at some point I kind of got away from OBT, and uh, this is why. Uh, number one, uh, I had to, I got a different computer, and I had to update. Uh, quick load and you know I'm, i just go looking for a download and no no you got to order the the dvd or whatever the cd they still send you one and of course i no longer had a cd rom <laughs> so i said well uh i didn't worry about it so but the reason i i kind of got away from your model is because the tuner would you know once i started using tuner i started using tuners over over 10 years ago Right. This is back. I told you when I was looking for an edge, like what, what, how do I, you know, how do I show up with a better gun than everyone else? Right. Well, that's where the tuners came in. I'm like, oh, I can line this up with, you know, I can line them. I can line everything up. The tuner allowed me to do that. And at the time I had a gunsmith. I, I wasn't doing my own barrel work. And I would order, I don't know, for example, you know, based on the OBT, I would order the barrels that length. Right. Well, I would, they'd show up and they'd be like, you know, quarter inch or half an inch short. And, you know, now you got to cut it way back to, to, to get onto the next one, right? The next, uh, what do you call it? Node window. No, yeah. That's what I've been calling it. Yeah. So you'd, you know, and then of course I'd be upset and I call him up and he'd be like, Oh, that crap doesn't work. Just, just shoot it. It'll be fine. And so I was always having this, this, uh, you know, all these obstacles. So once I started using the tuner, I found that I could get it to match up again, right? Uh, but also, I would start with OBT, but then I also had to, because as you said also, if you don't have quick load perfectly tuned and, you know, powder rate change, humidity, it, it just always had to, you know, like the name of the podcast, believe the target. So I would start with something, then I would find myself having to go to the range and verify everything. And then I found sometimes that, hey, this thing is farther away than I thought. So then I had to go back and load some more outside of that target zone. And when that happened, and then I had tuners, and then I realized, you know, a uh, quick load, I'm not going to, you know, it's a pain in the ass to update it. So I said, you know what, why am I doing this? Let's just do the whole thing from start to finish and kind of funnel it in, right? Start with a big funnel and shrink it, shrink it, shrink it. And that's kind of how I developed my load development method. You know, I, I developed the method in which I don't I don't leave anything on the table. And then I, you know, it works for me. But I did OBT for a long time. And I mean, it works uh, kind of like you're talking about. After I read your, your uh, paper on OBT, I started going back to all the uh, all the loads that I had found that worked in barrel length. And once I input the uh, all the data and, and quick load, they matched up just fine. So it, it was very interesting to, to find that out. But it was also, you know, difficult to keep everything in tune because quick load can be, as you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Trash in, trash out, garbage yeah, in, garbage, garbage out. In. Yep. <laughs> so, you know. It's I, only as good as the model. And that means you got to get exactly the right um, uh, case. Case volume's got to be right. The bullet seating depth's got to be right. The, the powder, just the powder model that you get with quick load. I mean, 
you end up having to calibrate your powder model to the actual lot of powder that you have. And as you said, it, it, it takes a lot of work to get it in tune and then it doesn't take much, but to have one thing change and you're out of tune again. Right. And, um, uh, again, once I started using tuners, um, uh, you know, I still worried about barrel length, trying to get it really close, but then I found out that I could still kind of compensate with a tuner to, to get everything to match up again. And that's, right. that's some of the things that a lot of people don't understand about tuners. They, uh, you know, they say, well, it's too light or it's too heavy. It's too, you know, it, it, it doesn't take much. How much, what's the stretch on a 31 and a half inch barrel? What, what, how much do you think it'll shrink? Well, you mean under the, the pressure pulse? Yeah. I mean, it's gotta well, be. Well, it's, it's, it's localized, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, with, so the chamber, let's say your, your chamber is a, you got a uh, 284 Shahani, right? Right. Got what? Three inches approximately? Uh, 2.3. Yeah, some, okay. Something like that. Let's call it two for the purposes yeah. of discussion. So if that chamber uh, expands by, let's say, four thousandths of an inch, which is probably pretty close, depending mm -hmm. on the barrel that you've got, when the pressure, you get about a third of that shrinkage, right? Because that Poisson's ratio in steel is 0.33. Okay. So... So let's call that, um, let's call it two thousandths of an inch. Okay. So for that, that 100 and 200 microsecond where that curve's popping up, that pressure curve, that front of that, uh, that chamber is shrinking by about two thousandths of an inch. So there is a, like I said, this shock wave that goes that the, the mass of the barrel doesn't want to move. But the back of the barrel is being pulled back 2,000 an inch that fast. So even though steel is really strong and really stiff, it's still going to distort a little bit. That distortion is going to go, going to leave and go at the speed of sound because it, it's it's in the longitudinal direction. So I would say that that disturbance is maybe a couple thousandths of an inch. And again, that's going to depend on how big the barrel is, or you know, the, around the chamber, how thick the barrel is in front. All of that's going to affect the actual dimensional distortion. And I'm not, I've never been able to come up with, and I'm still thinking about how to do it, a set of instrumentation to actually measure this distortion. Because it's it's so fast and it's so small um, that strain gauges like you would use for pressure trace, the electronics just doesn't have enough bandwidth to be able to capture that. So I'm thinking about some other techniques that I could use. And uh, maybe if I get some time here as I start slowing down from work, maybe I'll put a little effort into trying to do that. Because I really would like to get some pictures of this because I know it's got to be there. Um, so maybe a couple thousandths of an inch, a pulse that's probably maybe two or three inches long. Think of it as a, a little constriction that flies yeah. up in now, is this where a tuner has so much influence when you move a tuner one thousandth of an inch? You think that's what? Cause... Well, I personally don't think the tuner being a threaded device on there is going to be changing the the reflection point of that wave. That reflection point is basically going to be at the, the end of the main steel and that tuner hanging off of there. Because I've, I've done this with, with and without muzzle brake, I, my group size is the same. Now, the, the point of impact changes, but the group mm. size stays pretty much the same. And I just put a suppressor on and off a tuned rifle and it didn't change the group size. It just moved the point of aim. So I'm still confident in that that physics is right. However, the tuner is definitely going to change the, the frequency or the phasing of whatever bending modes in there. And some of those bending modes can be very, very high frequency. They're not like the main ruler on the edge of a table they're not the, the first mode. They're very high. They may have multiple wavelengths worth of distortions going on at the same time. So it could show up as a group dispersion, okay? But it's not from the shock wave. It could be from the, well, the effect of the firing on the bending. And I think that is where the tuner comes in because that's basically varying the length of this stiff bar of steel 
And you could change the phasing of that relative to the exit time to get it to be hopefully as minimal amount of, of motion. You, you don't want it tipping like this because that'll change the angle of exit. You want it bending like this because if your muzzle moves up five thousandths of an inch on a 30 inch barrel, okay, that angular, that's very little angle. If it's if it's bending like this, it could have a, over a shorter distance, it could be a lot more of an angle. I don't know, maybe I'm more articulate. It's kind of more no, I get better it. I served get with it. Uh, pictures. So yeah, Speedy Speedy was here and he did a very simple demonstration with a ruler. You know, he put the weight in the back, put it in the front, and you know, it, it it was a very clear oh yeah observation of how it works. And of course a lot of people <laughs> said, Well, that's not how a barrel works. Well, it is. <laughs> it's just obviously much faster, much not as not as fast. I mean, we can't even see it unless you use high speed uh, photography. But the 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 whole the idea is there. Like you, you, you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. um, he also did a. He had his base with him, and I don't know if you saw that one. And he had it, and he pulled on the string, and he had an electronic tuner, mm -hmm. and it was perfectly in tune. And all he had to do is turn his base ninety degrees, and it yep. went out of tune because the uh, the neck is not mm -hmm. pulling. Uh, you know, and. Mm -hmm. uh, the point is, it doesn't take much to to make a big change. That's um, great, but it, it's just it's just all very, very interesting. So the tuners, um, I've always been fascinated by them, um, and it always seemed to me that it would be a very tricky thing to try to start from scratch and get everything in tune. So I think it's really commendable that you you've spent the effort to um, to try to figure out a process where you can bring, you know, the charge weight and probably the shock wave timing and the barrel bending timing and in, in into synchronization. So so and, I did it a pretty crude way. I mean, again, I, I've been doing this for over 10 years and, and I, I have, I'm lucky enough that I have a, a private thousand yard range where I can, you know, at a hundred, it's one thing, but when you're doing it at a thousand, it's everything gets amplified. And, uh, it finally, we just, we don't want a load that is not stable. I'm going to call it stable, right? Which means low SD, low ES. And I found that it didn't matter if it shot good, or even at a thousand, that I had to have low ES and SD. And, you know, and now we're talking about positive compensation, right? But that's, a, that's another topic. These topics take hours and hours to discuss. That's why I'm trying to avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I ultimately wanted a load that was stable. Low ES, low SD, very consistent. Because that just told me that combustion. I, I, I simplify things so much for them to work for me, and it just turns out that it uh, it also has worked well for many people. Just the way I simplified it, and the way I simplified it was combust three three buckets, <laughs> three columns: combustion, barrel harmonics, and external ballistics. Mm -hmm. Combustion is anything that has to do with your ES and SD, right? Your powder, your primer, how much powder, uh, the type of powder, the type of primer, uh, neck tension, case capacity, uh, all that that's going to affect your combustion. I put that in one column. The next column is barrel harmonics, right? And that's pretty simple. I'm going to say, again, I'm, I'm a very simplistic person. And I'm just going to, the only thing I put in that column was seating depth and tuner. And that's going to affect not not the combustion, but only how the groups shape and where they print. And then the next thing I threw in the next column was external ballistics, meaning once that bullet is in the air, there's nothing else the rifle can do. Mm -hmm. It's over. A lot of people will have a load that shoots great at 100 yards, and then they won't shoot at 1,000. You know, it'll shoot great at 100 yards with very low SD, and it won't shoot at 1,000. So then they go changing their load again. 
And I, in my in my head, it's like, no, no, once the bullet is in the air at relatively the same speed as each other and going through the same hole at 100 yards, the rifle did all it could. If they're mm-hmm. not grouping at 1,000, now it's the bullets. They have mm-hmm. inconsistent BC, something's wrong with the bullets. So, again, I, those are the three columns. And once I did that, I said, well, got to handle one at a time. And it's pointless to handle the last two if your combustion isn't right. So that's where I started. I first start by, okay, well, where do I put the bullet at, right? I mean, you got to start somewhere. So that's when I said, well, the point that I don't want to be at is jam point, where the bullet can stick in the barrel. That's obviously where I don't want to be. However, I want to be as close to that as possible to give me the most case capacity, stay away from the donut, and just give me the most room to work from, right? Just pretty much start on one end and, and work my way towards the other. So I started just seating my bullets. I jam and then back them off 20 thousands. I said, that ain't going to stick a bullet. And then I would just go and work on my powder charge. Powder charge, types of powder, primer, con- neck tension, whatever it took until I got a really good just load that is very consistent. I wasn't worried about groups, because to me, that's a harmonic thing, right? Mm-hmm. Once I had that load, that, that shot really good, very consistent, the groups didn't move around, then I would do seating depth test. And then with seating depth, I could vary, you know, the shape of the group. And, and then once I was done with that, obviously, depending on how much you move the bullet, it's going to affect combustion, slightly mm-hmm. right but then mm-hmm. i just go back and then I, now at that point all i had to do is test on each side of kind of where i was mm-hmm. you know two three tenths to five tenths and then i found that okay i'm i'm in the middle i, I wanted to be in the middle right and then i go and do tuner test right and guess what i most of the time i found i could get it smaller most of the time. Sometimes I couldn't get any better because I did my seating depth test already, right? And that sometimes that's just as good as it got. Well, again, over the years, I started playing around with, wait, what if I just leave the seating depth alone and I do a tuner first, tuner mm-hmm. test? Well, I started doing a tuner test first. And then when I go back to do a seating depth test, again, I found that I couldn't improve on them much. And then I'm like, well, there's definitely a correlation between tuner and seating depth. And again, I don't know what it is. I'm not smart enough to know, but I just know that there is. And again, the name of the, my podcast is Believe the Target because that's all the information that I have. I don't care why it does it. <laughs> as long as they shoot tiny groups, I'm happy, right? So, I have same philosophy. So that's that's where I I'm at right now with with my whole load development. It, it's it's uh it's been extremely simplified, um, and it works. It, it works for me. Uh, I've had many others try it. It works for them, but you know that's kind of how you know I went about it. A long time ago, I used to do things at a hundred yards, everything at a hundred yards, because again I was like, well, if it doesn't shoot at a hundred. It's not going to shoot long range, which that in itself becomes a controversial topic. <laughs> There's just so many controversial topics, but I'm I'm just took things uh, the the I guess the easy way out and just just go shoot at the target, have the target tell you whether it matters or not. But the thing that you're saying is is if you do load development, you need to pick a process and stick to that process so that you do things consistently every time. And the point is, is the discipline of maintaining that process and records and getting good data, that's the key part to this. And because you could probably have gone at it two or three different ways in different sequences. As you said, you've tried seating depth first, then tuner, and then you tried tuner and seating depth. But the point is, you're doing you're doing things in a very systematic way, and where people I think get into trouble is they will look at one load on one day and see a really tight group and say, "Oh, there it is," and then 
they're not consistent and they're not exploring the the dynamics over say powder charge or temperature and they can get caught into false positives if you will and i think that discipline is really important to this sort of precision shooting one other thing that i do is uh I'll, I'll say, okay, this is my load. This is it. Then I load it, and I'll go shoot 25 shots, 1,000 yards, right? Oh, man, that shot great. That's that's good. Well, the next day I go back, and, oh, it's windy now. Let's go shoot it again. Well, it didn't do so good. I don't change anything. I'm just gathering data. I'm mm -hmm. practicing, but at the same time, like, okay, well, that didn't shoot so good today. That's okay. Go back the next day. Oh, okay, it's back to shooting kind of decent. And then the next day, he shoots amazing again, right? Uh, but, you know, I'm doing 20, 25 shot groups. Uh, and it's when I say it doesn't, it doesn't do great, I mean, I shot one the other day that that was my load, and it shot one MOA at 1,000 yards. It's still good, but it's not something that I would like to take to a competition, right? Uh, but oftentimes, as you said, they'll they'll get one three shot group that's just a just a wallet keeper right and that's that's the load that's the load that's the uh and nothing wrong with that confidence is a big big part of the game just huge part of the game if you're confident that's that's better than the the, the alternative right but in f class or even any type of competition you have to because we're shooting 25, you know, 20 shot strings, right? So you have to prove it over 20 shots at least. At and least. Uh, a paper that I, I don't want to call it a paper. It was just a post on Accurate Shooter where I warned people against falling for that small group, that one tiny little group. I said, don't fall for that. Test a wide enough range to where you're looking for consistency, Consistency is better than one small group, right? So, so where do you fall on this whole load development thing? I, I mean, I kind of get an idea. Well, so I've never totally. Okay, I'll just say flat out: OBT is is a mechanical theory with some empirical data based on a software model that you can't control. To me. It just gives you a starting point. It gives you a frame of reference to say, maybe somewhere in here, this is about where I should start looking. But everything you just mentioned about seating depth and neck tension and you know the harmonics, I mean, that, that's a beautiful way to break it down. I still end up doing exactly the same thing. It's all about what happens at the range and the target. Nothing counts unless it's good at the range you're shooting. And if you're shooting at a thousand yards, you pretty much have to test at a thousand yards if you're fortunate enough to have that access. For me, the best I can do is my local range is a 600 yard range. But at 600, I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to see if something's really not going to hang together, I'll see it. And if it is hanging together, I'll see that too. And so I've had pretty good luck with proving loads at 600. And then when I do go to the thousand yard competition, so this was back when I was shooting a lot. I would, I would see pretty good correlation. So for me, Eric, it's basically the same thing. It's about the target and it's about consistency. Um, it's about trying to make sure that you have enough um, dynamic range, it's an engineering speak from the RF world, but you have enough range in that load over all the variables that you can't control that it's still going to shoot for you in a consistent way. And that right there will give you confidence. If you're confident that when you point that rifle and you've and you've done a good job of the wind, it's gonna go where you want it to go, that makes you more confident. For me, I've had just the opposite where I had a rifle that didn't fit me well and I was having trouble getting behind it and executing the shot well. And I lost confidence in that rifle and I was constantly second guessing myself. Am I doing this right? Am I doing, and, and that just, the whole match stopped being fun at that point. And so uh, for me, it's, again, it's, it's really exactly what you're saying. It's about what's on the target and do you have that dynamic range uh, 
can you have that compliance over the load? I would go so far as to take a heating pad to the range because here it's in, I'm in Washington state. It gets pretty cold in the winter when I'm doing a lot of load development, you know, the forties and thirties, I'll bring a heating pad and I'll throw 10 rounds in there and wrap it up while I'm doing some other stuff and I'll get them to 125 Fahrenheit and I'll put them in one at a time and quickly fire them so they don't cool off in the chamber. And I'll see how the temperature the ammo temperature affects the velocity and the group position. That was the best that I could do to try to simulate going to, I don't know, Raton or something like that in the middle of summer. And we, we do the opposite. I, I put them in the ice chest <laughs> yep. to cool them. Uh, but yeah, I've done that test as well. And it's, it's, it's something that everyone should do because you will, you know, Get ready to get your feelings hurt because sometimes that just destroys your load. But that's what you want. Oh, yeah. You want to find out if 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 going somewhere else is going to and this is you know to destroy your load. And this goes back to the dynamic range that you just, you spoke about about how stable is your load, right? You know, are you in a very narrow load, or do you have enough latitude that you can move around? all over the country or even travel and not right. have your load blow apart. Uh, this is where I, I'm glad you brought up dynamic range because this is something that people, people always ask, why do we need to load to one kernel of a, of a, of a grain of powder? And I said, you don't, if you're a really good reloader and you can understand dynamic range and you can find this really wide node, you don't have to load to that level of precision, right? However, the tighter your charges are, right? Let's say instead of loading to 0.1 grain, you're loading to 0.02 grains of a, of a, of a you know, powder. You have this window that's, I'm going to say the, the width of the screen right here, all right? <laughs> this, is, this is your load where your load is stable, right? and you're loading your, your powder to here, you can only move around from here to here, and you fall out. Okay. Whereas if you have a really good scale that gets you this, you, have, you can go a really far way before you fall out of tune. That's the benefit of a really good uh, scale. But if you can keep it here, you can have a pretty crappy scale. You, you can throw with a powder thrower. I mean, that's what benchers guys do most of the time. And as long as you can keep it inside of that window or that node, you're going to be fine. I mean, I loaded with the charge master for many years. I made, I made high master and F class long range loading with a charge master. Mm -hmm. But of course the better scales give you just more, more safety more room to to move around you know right. temperatures you're what? just reducing the, the variable the variables you're you're controlling all the variables you can't control that is the best the best way to put it f class matches and you know many other matches but f class for sure because we preload everything many f class matches i won in the reloading room by controlling what you can. Because once you get out there, there's going to be a lot of things going on that you can't control that you have to manage. And, you know, once you have a bad load, you know, if you have a tuner, you can you can kind of try to fix it depending on how far off you are. But if you're way off, it, the, nothing's going to fix it. You're in the weeds. <laughs> yeah. And... I think it's probably happened to everybody that shot F class that something goes bad, you know, the powder, you've got a new lot of powder and you thought you had it worked up, but you didn't. And you just have a bad day. <laughs> yeah. <you> have <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a bad day for sure. The, uh, so let's talk about the barrel vibration. What do you, what do you call that? you know the the actual vibration of the barrel oh the the bending modes bending the modes m-o-d-e-s modes yeah as in you know well a vibrating string right right 
held at two ends. It goes like this. That's your first mode. And then there's one where it's going like this. And then there's, so there's two humps and then three humps and four humps. That's, you know, successively higher, mo higher frequency mm -hmm. and uh, shorter displacement of the strings. And, and the same thing's happening in a barrel, but it's all in three dimensions. Right. And it's, I've seen models where it, it's going like a helix. It looks mm -hmm. like it's bending in a, like a spring, a coiled spring and bouncing around that way. Very complicated. And I think a lot of that depends on how the barrel is hung on the receiver. And that's why I think that a really well-built rifle, you know, with a good stiff receiver and it's bedded really well, you don't have that movement. That movement is rock solid. Okay. So at least if it's going to take off and go into some vibration due to the shot, that it's consistent from one shot to the next. Imagine what would happen if that receiver is kind of shifting around in the stock. Then, yeah, got and, and, <laughs> and that goes back to you know, for example, if you if you do have a receiver that's moving or something, you know, speedy, and pretty much anybody high level competition, they're going to talk about ignition, you know, igniting, just striking right. the primer. You have to do that precisely the exact same way every time. But if that's not right, then everything else is going to seem like a moving target, right? And there'll be so many errors stacked on top of each other, it'll be almost impossible to separate them. In other words, by doing an experiment with charge weight, you're not going to see the, the effect of that charge weight because it's going to be covered up by these other problems. Um, I've had problems with uh, neck tension and... Um, I got bit on my 65284 here a couple of years ago is I got um, got lackadaisical about my my case trim length. And some of my cases um, got a little long and it started running into the carbon ring at the end of the at the end of the chamber. And it was actually starting to just grab the neck a little bit. And so the bullets weren't releasing consistently because it depended on how long the ch chamber was. Or the the case was, and that drove me crazy, and then I I realized I was sloppy. So well, there's that consistency problem. That's where barrel cleaning comes in, right? Right. Keep it the same. Uh, Jack Neary, I just had a conversation with him, and he he was talking about uh, trim length. Got to keep them all the same every time, because uh, it will it will show on target. Now, those guys are shooting. 0.1 inch groups, 150s, right? So they they really see mm -hmm. everything, every minor little thing. But I did a test a long time ago where I convinced myself just through testing that you have to keep your breast trimmed. So now that's became part of my process. My breast gets trimmed every time. And, you know, I just use a drill trimmer, which is simple. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, it's just... Uh, it needs to be done. The barrel needs to be cleaned. The carbon ring. Make sure right. that doesn't get away from you. It just because the again, I'm no scientist, but once you go prove something or you test something, right? You're trying to re replicate everything as close as you can so that you right. can expect the same results, correct? That's right. That's the basis of good experimental technique, is that um that everything is consistent. You follow the same process. Everything is re is repeated. Um, and if you do an experiment and demonstrate something, and somebody else tries to re recreate that experiment and can't, there's two possibility. Well, probably more than two, but two two major ones. One, you didn't you didn't prove what you expected to prove, or two, they didn't follow the same experimental procedures that you did. But so it really doesn't matter whether I do the same things that you do. The key is whatever I work up that works for me is that I keep that process the same. That's that discipline I was mentioning earlier. And, and I used to religiously trim my brass and I got sloppy. And I, I was saying, well, and I was just, I was occasional match and, and maybe a, a plinking at prairie dogs at a thousand yards away, you know. And I got a little sloppy and I let things get away. And that's when I got caught by the brass link. And 
it, it really is important that, that that consistency be there. And I think it's the same way when you go to the range and you get behind the rifle and you settle in and you're going to break a shot that you try to, for me anyway, I have to get everything, I have to get in the right position so that I'm, I'm in a consistent position, that I'm not awkward, that my weight's in the right place. Um, otherwise, I have trouble with consistency, just, you know, getting the shot off. And some days I think my head is in better space for that. And I have better patience. Some days if I'm impatient, then I get a little, you know, a little quick. And that's when I don't shoot as well. Well, this is where dry firing comes into play, right? Because all you're trying to do is build that muscle memory of getting comfortable, right? Because sometimes in F class, you have to lay there for 30 minutes and you have to be comfortable the whole time. And whenever it's time to go, it's really hard to start thinking, oh, the wind's picking up, the flag's doing this, whatever. My, my angle flag is matching, you know, my angle flag and my speed flag are matching up. The mirage, everything looks good. Now I need to, okay, focus on your trigger squeeze, focus on your cheek weld. You can't do all of that. All that has to be automatic. automatic. And all yeah. you need to worry about is the wind and breaking a good clean shot, right? You can't. So that needs to be done ahead of time. I went shooting uh, last week and I took one of my machinists because he's, we never take him to the ranch. I said, hey, let's go. Let's go to the ranch. And he was out there with me and I started getting all my gear out you know set up my rest my my shooting mat my elbow pad my my timer i mean everything and then i shoot i think i shot uh two strings of 25 right took me about an hour you know i shot 25 and then i waited and then and then it's like okay and then everything goes back in the truck everything goes back in its place and he goes my goodness, you bring a lot of crap to the range. I said, well, that's what I compete with. So I have to set it up exactly the same way because sure. this is where I find out whether, you know, today I'm going to put this loading block just right here or I'm going to put it over here or whatever, right? You experiment. And it's in practice where you're going to find out if it works or not. It's something right. so simple as reaching for, for a round. If it's mm -hmm. too far, you just break in your position. It's, it's, but anyway, very interesting that you have to replicate everything. Yeah. I, uh, to the extent that you can do that the same every time, I think that will remove again, removing or minimizing those variables and, and those are controllable, right? And that leaves you with the uncontrollables, but you just have to deal with. And hopefully that's the wind that that's your big variable, right? That's the thing that, that, that game is about it, when you're at a thousand yards, it's, it really comes down to if all the other variables are under control, it's how well can you read those conditions and, and, and make the right decisions at that point. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, Back to your OBT. Are you still a pretty active shooter? Uh, not as much as I would like to be. I, my job, I got into a, a different set of projects here about, about 10 years ago. Um, actually, it's a little more than 10 years ago now, about 2009, 2010. And, it, and it, I ended up traveling a lot mm. globally and uh, spent a lot of time away. And I've kind of backed away from it. Um, however, my plan is over the next three or four years to, to get back into it. That's, basically. that's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if you're going to, we're going to have any advancements in, in your research and hopefully get to the point where we can just, uh, get an app on our phone and type it in and <laughs> there's my load. <laughs> the, yeah, the, that would, that would be nice. The, the Chris Long, uh, reloading app. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my plan is to try to get back into it. We, I'm lucky here in the Seattle area that we've got a fairly active group of, as you probably know, oh, yeah. Alma and F-class shooters. And um, my local range has is, is got a lot of high power shooting. We have a lot of competitions and there's two or three ranges around here. Um, it is a little more difficult to shoot a thousand yards, but I either have to go to Eastern Washington or, or down into Oregon. Um, but um, it's still not a day trip, right? It's, it's a couple hours of driving. So, um, 
my hope is to get back into it and um because uh, i really enjoy it and i and i i miss it um and uh, uh there's a tremendous set of satisfaction when you do start to do all these things right and and the results show up and even though you may not win the match if you're if you feel like you went out there and you know i did a pretty decent job of of getting everything right and reading the conditions and because sometimes it's just the luck of the draw sometimes you get a bad call and and you drop a nine and and that's the difference or maybe uh one or two x is different if you're really having a good day right so well that's something that you know we started this whole new format of shooting called the v square finale where we we put shooters they pair fire they're on the same target and it's an elimination format <laughs> you oh, the only person you're shooting against is whoever is your partner that's it right and alternate shots pair fire and we've seen it to where one shooter can be hitting liner x's and the next shooter can be hitting liner tens. I mean, literally a quarter of an inch difference is what's separating the the winner from the loser, right? Wow! But it's it, it it's it's very fun to actually see it live because that's really what happens when you're shooting, right? You know, you you, you know, you, how many times did you shoot a match where you caught liner tens, and how many times did you shoot a match where there were as close to a 10 as possible, they were nines, right? Right. And that's what happens. But to be able to see it live and, you know, one shot after the other, where they're both kind of tracking, you know, you can tell they have really good guns because they're kind of stacking shots on top of each other. But it just so happens that one guy's getting 10s and the other one's getting Xs <laughs> or nines and 10s. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I just bought a shot marker. And okay. I'm just about ready to go out and get that uh, uh, dialed in. I've got the target stands all built. And um, uh, so I was going to give that a go. And uh, a couple of my friends, and of course, the range is now using them. So I think that's going to be, a, a, for me, that's going to be a big plus up in shooting matches is, uh, is having that electronic target uh, you, you feedback. Don't, you don't, and you don't have to pull up targets when you go to a match now. It's so that's, much fun because you get to... You get to shoot. It's a lot more efficient. And when you're not shooting, you get to talk to your buddies, you know, and have a good time yeah. because yeah. you don't have to be in the pits pulling targets. Yeah. Range, yeah. It's, Especially it's, on a thousand yard range where it takes, you know, you got to drive there. <laughs> I shoot at Bayou uh, and they, they use electronic targets for club matches. And we start shooting at 8 a.m. By about 11 o'clock, we're done shooting three 20 shot strings by 11. And and yep. I'm talking 40 to 50 people. Okay. Yep. And then uh, we do a two strings of 15 pair fire, mm -hmm. two siders and 15 for record. And typically we're done by about 1230. By one o'clock, we, we're at the restaurant eating lunch. And that's, that's, that's I'm talking 100. 110 shots on target. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I love e-targets. <laughs> Great technology. Yeah. Yep. Well, Chris, this has been very, uh, interesting. Uh, like I told you, I, I used OBT for a long time and I found it to this day. I find it very interesting. Um, uh, so I'm glad I was able to talk to you about it some more. Well, happy to talk to you. Uh, uh it's, uh, I get a lot of feedback uh, via the internet and uh, occasionally people like yourself will, you know, uh, a good chance to interact with them. And I'm, I'm just glad it's working out and helping somebody. Um, I never meant it to be the end solution, but just kind of a, a learning process. And um, I think the approach of integrating it in with uh, what you see on the target, that's really the only way I've never considered it to be anything else than a, uh, a step along the way it's a very good tool for narrowing down the powders yeah you know the powders and the uh you know barrel length kind of like you discussed and uh okay something 
it just happened last week. I, I, I had a barrel and I had to set it back. And uh, one of my machinists, he says, well, my, now you're going to lose a lot of speed. I said, no. I said, I think when you shorten it, you have to, uh, sometimes they tune at a faster speed. Yep. And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, yeah. I said, when you shorten the barrel and you retune it, it actually goes faster. You, you know, you, you, you have to push it faster. You have to push it faster to get back in the node. And he's like, that makes zero sense. I always thought you lose speed. I said, well, you, you lose for the same powder charge. You will lose speed. I said, but to get back in tune, you have to go faster. You have to push it harder, which, and that's what the thing I, I told him. I said, I don't, I don't like that. It's shorter. Cause I gotta, I gotta beat on my breast harder. You know, I gotta beat on that breast now even more. And he goes, Anyway, and he asked me, how did you figure that out? I said, OBT. And literally, this is something that I remember from over 10 years ago that I learned from you. Just sitting around studying all the OBT nodes. And uh, it's something that is uh, most people don't realize. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Uh, I've, I often will set back my uh, competition barrels and go, go varmint shooting with them. And they work fine for that. And you're absolutely right. You know, you've got to uh, got to bump up the charge weight typically, and uh, uh, you'll you'll lose velocity, but to get the timing back, you end up having to run higher pressures. So the uh, the uh, oh, what was I? Oh, yeah, speed nodes. Before we go, <laughs> and this is probably a very big topic. Uh, you've heard, I don't know if you have, but this is something that you hear. For example, is like, oh, well. The 180 hybrids, they like to go 2850. Or the, the uh, you know, 140, 65, they, they like to go 2930 or 2730 or something of that nature. Is there such a thing as a bullet just liking a certain speed? Or is it just do you think it's just a combination of that everybody's using very close to the same thing? I, I believe it's the latter. That's my personal opinion. Um, because I think the way you broke it down into ignition and harmonics and external ballistics, if you use that same thought process and decomposition, that how can the bullet, you know, once it leaves, it's gone and either it's going to fly right or it won't. So it's either going to come down to ignition or harmonics. And uh, if everybody is using similar powders and similar speed ranges and similar barrel lengths. Yeah, I could see how you'd end up clustering. Look at the bench rest folks with the six PPC, you know, everybody was talking about with a 68 grain flat base, you know, everybody's running so many grains of this and they're running at these speeds and, and probably those distributions are really, really tight because everybody's running in the same thing in the same with the same basic load. Um, I don't think it's intrinsic to the bullet. I think it's intrinsic to that particular case, okay? So I, I would be surprised that a, uh, let's take a 6.5, that a 6.5 Creedmoor shooting 140 grain bullet, which I don't know if you can, probably a little big for that, but versus say a, 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 a 6.5, like a 6.5284 or one of the other uh, short mag type combinations, I don't know how those could be that close. That's got to be completely different case capacities. So they must be talking about a similar caliber as well. Deep well, so so blood. so, uh, for example, uh, often people will say, "Well, there's a with a 180 hybrid. There's a 2980 node, 2980 feet per second node that you know you need. For example, an Remington short action ultra magnum to be able to hit that node or, you know, there's a 2900 node or whatever. I, I just don't believe there's such a thing. I think you can, uh, I think it has to do with the, you know, barrel length, uh, case capacity, primer, uh, powder burn rate. Cause I know for a fact, and this is just based on my own testing. Let's say my 284 Shaheen. And let's say I'm shooting, I don't know, reloader, not reloader, but a uh, bit of Ori 555, for example. Okay. Um, and I'm using Federal 210 
primers. It's going to tune at around 2860. Okay, that's kind of where it tuned, right? But if you change the primer, only the primer, it's going to tune at a different speed, right? Because mm-hmm. now, essentially, by changing the primer, you change the powder burn rate, right? right. And that pressure curve changes. Right. So now it's, it's, so now it's going to tune at a different speed, timing. right? The timing is different. Right. And if you change powder, so so the the, the, the problem with, primers oftentimes people say well i'm going to test different primers they'll work up a load and then they they, once they have a load then they try the exact same load with different primers and see which one i'm like that's not how you test primers (laughs) yeah got it you've got to change the um you've got to start exploring over charge weights if you change your primer because it's going to change the ignition profile i really think a lot happens in that first uh, on that rise to the peak pressure in that first two, 300 microseconds that it takes for it to get there. It's the slope of that and the timing relative to the, uh, you mentioned the firing pin strike, That that's a disruption that starts things moving. And like you said, it's gotta be consistent. So from that strike to the point where the bullet then engages the rifling and, and meet, meets peak pressure, bullets only moved a couple, three inches, depending on, on um, on the bullet and the chambering, but it hasn't moved very far by the time you hit peak pressure. So it's, everything's happening. Everything that sets up that time is happening in that first initial, initial burn. So it's gotta be, uh, it's gotta be a function of the powder. I, I would say that that generic statement that a, a weight and a cartridge means a particular node, I, I don't know how that can hold. Because I know personal experience going from a very fast powder to a slower powder, I can get a 70, 80 foot per second variation in muzzle velocity, both in tune. So how could that be for the same bullet? Right. How, how could that be? I, I, I'm not saying that it's it's wrong, but I think it's maybe an oversimplification. That. I believe it is. They oversimplify it. And, and I don't have a problem with people saying that. Other than a lot of people will zero in on that statement, and the, the the perfect load for them may be just as close as half a grain apart, mm-hmm. but because it is not the speed that they were told to shoot at, now they're missing out, you know, on right. what what they could have they could have had a really good load, but they don't just oh. because. The, I always subscribe to the thing that says, uh, "Don't." want something so bad that you're willing to pass up something better and i think that's that this falls under that uh you know uh column or or category of right and again it's all about the target right target doesn't lie no not yet (laughs) i've accused it of lying a few times but it hasn't lied to me yet (laughs) Anyway, all right, Chris, I appreciate this. Appreciate you doing oh, this. Me too. Thank you. Chris. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get to do it again whenever you figure out the uh, your app that uh, that <laughs> that gives you the perfect load every time. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the chat. Thank you, Chris.